Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. <clears throat> We're going to get started. I'm so, I'm so grateful to Rosa for bringing this opportunity to our community. Um, this is Rosa Lowinger. For those who don't know, she and her husband, Todd Kessler, have been members of our community for, is it about five years or so? Um, five years. And her beautiful book, which is called, whoops, sorry. Let me start that again. Her beautiful book is called Dwell Time, A Memoir of Art, Exile, and Repair. And it, our publication date was October 10th, 2023. So that is a hard time for a book to come out into this world, um, especially a book that's really grappling with questions of Jewish identity, um, that deals a lot with personal journey and communal journey, that deals with, with trial and triumph. Um, and what is most interesting to me about this, about this book and what I'm so excited to hear you share is how you have unearthed, excavated your own personal history as an artist to make sense and make meaning of your own story and our collective story. So, um, so we're going to hear a li um, we're going to hear a lot uh, more from Rosa, but I'm going to give you a quick uh, version of her bio. Rosa is a Cuban-born American writer and art conservator, the author of Tropicana Nights: The Life and Times of the Legendary Cuban Nightclub and Promising Paradise: Cuban Allure, American Seduction. She is the founder and current vice president of RLI Conservation, LLC, one of the United States' largest women-owned art and architectural con conservation firms, uh, a fellow of the American Institute for Conservation, the Association for Preservation Technology, and the American Academy in Rome. Rosa writes regularly for popular and academic media about conservation, historic preservation, the visual arts, and Cuba. So if you're planning a, a trip to Cuba or contemplating one, I'm we sure Rosa would be happy to talk to you. And maybe we'll do one together, we which would totally. be amazing. Um, but Rosa, I'm so uh, I'm excited for all of us to get the chance to learn from you and from your experience. So please join me in welcoming Rosa Lowinger in conversation. I'm going to, um, so this book is a memoir that is based on Primo Levi's The Periodic Table. It comes out of my reading that book. Um, I read it in 2009 when I was living in Rome for a year with my husband. And um, when I stumbled on that book, I thought to myself, there's a metaphor here for writing about my profession, which is art conservation, which is this kind of odd field that people don't really know much about. They don't quite understand what it is we do. Essentially, we are the repairers of the material, physical, art, and historic material world. So um, when I read the Periodic Table, and I bet a lot of people have read it, the idea of structuring a memoir around a profession, but also around he does it around the elements. I d thought, let's do it around materials. I, you know, I thought about it, and then it took me until the pandemic to really understand how that could come together. It also took my father dying. He died in 2019 in May, right before the pandemic, and it was um, a moment that brought a lot of things together for me. So I was born in Cuba. My parents were born in Cuba. My grandparents are Eastern European immigrants. And um, my, our, our needing to leave Cuba for the United States in 1961, as so much of the Cuban Jewish community did, was a moment of extreme trauma for my mother. And I'm just gonna read to you, not too much, but like the first page and a half of my book, just so you get the sense of setting, of the setting here. And some people I know have been to a couple of my other events, so thanks for bearing with me on this. So the chapter one is called Marble. It starts like this. In a Jewish orphanage on the edge of old Havana, a little girl drags a soapy rag over a long white marble tabletop. There are 20 of these tables, and twice a day, this six-year-old's job is to scrub 10 of them clean of chicken, rice, and black beans the typical ingredients of a Cuban supper. Pork would never be served here, of course. Neither would beef, because it costs too much. On Friday nights, the orphans might eat soup with matzo balls or long egg noodles slathered with chicken schmaltz. 
The girl likes both of these foods. But she won't eat kasha varnishkas, no matter how hungry she is, how much they spank her or send her to bed without hung bed hungry. She is maddeningly stubborn. Beatings don't subdue her. Neither does making her scrub the marble tables the hardest task given to any of the little ones. This girl became my mother. She was born on September 8, 1932, a national holiday in Cuba celebrating La Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, the island's patron saint. Most Catholic girls born on this day are named some version of Caridad, charity in Spanish. They are typically dressed in yellow baby clothes, the color linked to Ochung, the powerful Yoruba spirit deity that syncretizes with La Virgen de la Caridad. My mother's parents, Jewish immigrants, named her Ita in Yiddish and Ilda in Spanish. Three weeks later, her mother died. I was a 10 pound baby, my mother says, blaming herself. She also faults the system that required C-sections be authorized by a priest or rabbi. By the time the rabbi arrived at the hospital, I had torn my mother up, she says. In Afro-Cuban Yoruba religions, each orisha or spirit deity manifests specific qualities of the supreme being. Ochung controls fresh waters, rivers, divinity, fertility, and love. The men and women born under her guardianship are, the, are gregarious and seductive, the life of the party. But cross them and watch out. This river Oricha is vain, spiteful, and quick to anger. I don't forgive and I don't forget, my mother has said for as long as I can remember. Throughout my life, I received that warning. So, this, so I had a really difficult <laughs> childhood. Um, I was recently watching a documentary about Tyler Perry that I don't know if anyone has seen it. Um, and he talks about the incredible brutality of his stepfather. My mother was not that bad, but she was not good either. She was um, deeply traumatized by the Cuban Revolution because she had a destitute childhood with a lot of abandonment. She's very afraid of abandonment and poverty. And when she married my father, who's, who I, you know, I go through the entire history of my Eastern European family's arrival in Cuba and what they did, my father's father was very um, industrious. And he, you know, a few years after being in Cuba, he had businesses and my father was middle class. They had a comfortable lifestyle. And when they married, she finally could breathe a sigh of relief. So when the revolution happened, it upended her sense of security and I was an only child and she sort of took it all out on me. Um, but part of the, the journey of repair, and it has so much to, to resonate to what you said today, Rabbi Brous, which is was when you understand another person, you know, was a, it's been a little, I, I, I know my mother's a good person. She's a loving mother. She's not, an, she's not a person who hates her children. She loves people and loves me, but was nonetheless often brutal to me. And it took like a lifetime of thinking about it and, and processing and also becoming someone who repairs for a living, who, who fixes the material world to understand that um, damage comes from someplace. Damage originates somewhere. And, and I talk about this in the book that my work as an art conservator is yes, we need we we work with we have science. You know, our our work is based in science and chemistry, and it's based in understanding the material history of objects and knowing how to work with our hands and fix things. But fundamentally, what we do is we understand damage. We understand how damage happens, um, and when something gets broken, how it breaks is the key to putting it back together. And when I, somehow as I went through the journey of writing this book, because, you know, it's been a lifelong process, but I didn't know I was doing it. I didn't, I didn't realize that that's what I was doing because I've remained, I remained devoted to my parents, though I did need to put 3,000 miles between us. I, you know, that wasn't, it wasn't um, incidental that I moved across the continent. But um, understanding that damage 
really gave me a way of, of sewing, of stitching the pieces back together, even if they're not perfect. And, you know, I talk about certain things in the book, like in um, ceramics, or I, I know you've been doing ceramics. Ceramics are fascinating because when they break, they break kind of violently, but they are very, um, they lend themselves nicely to repair. Ceramics repair easily. And I remember once after the Northridge earthquake, I had a reporter in my studio who was asking me, isn't this daunting? There's a piece with like 30 pieces, and it's, it's not. But the thing about sometimes we allow the, the, the repairs to show because that's kind of where the humanity lies. It's in those, um, it's in those cracks that you fix. So that's the beginning of my book. That's kind of what it's about. And I talk about a journey because, you know, the other thing is when I was growing up in Miami, I was a Cuban immigrant, and there was a lot of, you know, anguish and angst about losing Cuba, losing Cuba. And to me, as a young girl, I thought, what? so what? We're here. We're in America. Everybody else wants to get in here. Get over it. It's great. And all I wanted to do was leave Miami. I just wanted to get out of there because I didn't understand that cloying nostalgia for this island lost. And I, you know, I made my way, I went to Brandeis, and then I went to NYU, and then I went to work in Philadelphia. I wound up you know, bopping around and wound up in Philadelphia. And for me, Philadelphia was like a revelation. Because Boston was like too cold and too full of students, and New York is, you know, overwhelming in every way. And Philadelphia, it felt like the Three Bears. Oh, this is just right. And we lived there for a few years, and then because m my then husband didn't get tenure at his job, we had to leave. I was just beside myself with heartbreak about having to leave this city that felt like the absolute best place for me to live. And it was only having lost that city that gave me an insight into what it must have been like for my folks who lost the place where they were born, their language, their, their culture, which was, which was different. Even though it was, it was a Jewish life, it was different. And it was recreated in Miami by many people, but it was a different type of experience. So... And now here I am, and I've been, I've, I realized one day that I l I've lived in L.A. longer than my entire family, from my grandparents to my parents to me, lived in Cuba. And yet I still don't think of myself as from L.A., even though I've lived here over 35 years, and think of myself as profoundly from Cuba, even though I've only been, I mean, well, I've been there many, many, many many times, and I'd love to take anybody who wants to go. <laughs> so that's the, yeah, thank you. Okay. Ha have a seat. Yes. Um, okay, so what we'll, we're going to have a little conversation, and I would love for all of you to be a part of it. So yes. I have a few questions, um, but really we're hoping that this is a collective um, conversation. So feel free to jump in at any point if, you're, if a question surfaces. Um, <clears throat> So you mentioned that the book is organized around different kind of materials. There's, yes. there's marble, there's concrete. And so I, I'm wondering, um, I, I love this. I, I mean, people who are interested in art and architecture are going to be really excited to read this because the insights are so profound. Can you give us a little bit more um, insight into the, the, your knowledge and understanding of conservation and the insight that that has given you into the human experience. And so, like, you described something very profound just now about as a, cons as a conservator, you know that you are, you, you have to find the source of the damage. You can't just repair it unless you, unless you go deeper to understand it. And clearly you tried, you did that work with your family story. What other insights can we learn from the material world that can help us on our own healing journeys um, as human beings. So the, the material world is, um, well, okay, as conservators, we, we repair things through a specific point of view. We um, are dealing with works of art and works of historic importance. So what we're trying to do is not alter them, not alter, 
and leave and do it and anything that we do needs to be able to be removed by someone else because you know you see so many works of art that were destroyed by overzealous restorations so Wait, we that's incre that's an incredible insight right there which i'm going to come back to sure yeah. um so what so our our impact needs to be measured and um based in humility so and you always have to approach the work with a great deal of doubt like i've you know as i, I read in the book i've repaired you know three dozen of those Tang Chinese horses that they always break in the same spot at those skinny legs. And I would look at them and I know exactly what's going on. But each time you have to kind of come as if you don't know. And you have to, you have to sort of, and I, and I mentor a lot of young students and you tell them you just have to put your preconceptions aside because one thing will happen that will surprise you and that's where the, the interesting thing is. And so when you repair though, Everything starts with knowing how something is made and then how it got damaged. Mm. And also sometimes we look at something and we think, you know, I can't tell you the number of times that somebody calls me to come in and look at something because it's broken. And I come in and I think, well, a break is easy to fix, but do you realize that all the glaze is about to fall off of this piece of ceramic or all the paint is coming off? And that is a much bigger problem because... So it, it requires a lot of... Um, respect for what it is that is happened and and it also um, pays homage if you will to process even when the process is one that is destructive mm. so honesty and humility and it seems also like S slowness, moving slowly yes. when what we want to do is move quickly to fix something because we're so uncomfortable with brokenness. Exactly, exactly. And being comfortable with brokenness. You know, I, in my house, <laughs> Todd, Todd will tell you, we have all kinds of broken ceramics that I just can't bear to throw out because they are being comfortable with brokenness, right? right? right. And um, being comfortable with with partial repairs or showing the repairs. You know this, um, the Japanese art of kintsugi mm -hmm. where you repair something and you highlight the join lines so that they, are, they remain visible. Or with archeological ceramics, you never repair, you never do the fills. You just, you put the pieces together, but you don't need to make them look like they never broke. Right, right. Actually, it reminds me of the story that Rabbi Jensen shared on Erev Rosh Hashanah, but they know that Hasidic story about the diamond. And in yeah. some ways, leaning into the wound instead of, instead of trying to erase it and pretend it never happened is such a powerful response to, to healing. And, and the, the cover of my book is a kriya. It's a tear that's been, um, that we, you know, we as Jews tear a garment to externalize the inner tear. And I love that the rabbis who were such practical people said you can't walk around all torn up all the time. Like if your pottery is too broken, you, it won't hold your, you know, your soup anymore. Right. And so you have to fix it, but don't be careful not to fix it in a way that will pretend that it was never broken before because there's a great strength that comes from recognizing through, you know, through being honest about where the pain was that this was at one point broken and is in a process of, 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 of healing and will never be the same as it was before. Exactly. And isn't that sort of like the story of so many of our holidays, like Hanukkah is a story of something that broke and that was fixed, but yes. it didn't, it doesn't get fixed in such a way that we don't remember that it broke. It's right. brokenness is what gives it meaning. Right. In fact, I mean, I was, I was reading about Hanukkah the other day and thinking about the incredible act of chutzpah of the Maccabees who went into the broken temple and decided to light something there. Like, didn't abandon what was broken, but said, this is going to be the birth of the next chapter. Right. Um, how do we With find the, the strength to, and, and the humility to rebuild after we've been really taken down to the, to the studs on something? Exactly, it's right. And that happens, you know, with, with earthquakes, with, yes. with everything, you know? It's, I'm, so, I'm so moved by that. And, and the, can you say something about the overzealous uh, healer, the one who works too hard to cover over what's broken and it only does more damage to a piece? And, and then translate that, if you will, into what you've learned about family dynamics. Oh, yes. Well, so in um, when I first started 
training in conservation, I went to the NYU Institute of Fine Arts Conservation Program, and at the, at the very moment that I started, there was, there was a material that had been uh, touted as being like the miracle fix-all for, for crumbling stone and ceramics. It was called soluble nylon. And that right when I entered school, they, were, they realized that soluble nylon was not soluble. You put it into a piece, it darkened, and it never came out. So the idea of, a mirac of the miracle repair, um, the thing that's going to just work, and you know, and, it, and they come up all the time, and, and we'll have people saying to us, but you know, there's this new product that, is, uh, that claims to be able to fix everything, and we know that these new, new products rarely do what they say they're gonna do, whereas the slow and steady, the skeptical mm -hmm. approach to repair and, and keeping it reversible or, re or retreatable, which is how we call it right now, remains the goal always. Now, from in, in, in the family story, I mean, the miracle in my family story with this is that, you know, my mother, who is, um, she's not diagnosed, so I hesitate to say this, but she bears a lot of the characteristics of a person with borderline personality disorder, and I say that with love in my heart because, you know, she suffered so much as a young mm -hmm. child, being abandoned, sent to an orphanage. Her father was alive when she went to the orphanage, but he couldn't take care of her, and she was kicked out of her aunt's house, and her grandmother was paralyzed. But she is a person who, for all her um, difficulty, is someone that you can work with and where you can, you can gain, through love, you can gain her, you can gain her. And, and, uh, and by the way, she saw this book and she read this book. Fantastic. Yeah, and, but the idea is, but it's a mistake to think, say with my mother, that you ever solve it, that it's mm -hmm. ever solved, because it's, it's, it's only temporary. Every repair with her is temporary. You never know the next time who she's going to be, and I just have to be comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And the thing, my mother's 91 right now, and she lives in Miami, and um, she's quite a character <laughs> in all kinds of ways. She's extremely funny and extremely volatile, but the thing about repair is like, I think to myself, if I had done this hard work, one day she will be gone, and I will not have done everything I can mm -hmm to repair to the extent possible. Right, right. I'm so, I, I'm, I hope people are thinking of what your questions will be. I'd love to, I'd love to engage everyone. I'm just gonna, I just wanna point out that your profession, the great care that you take with broken pieces of art, you then took with looking at your family story and applied that same kind of humility and perspective and slowness in, in looking and assessing, uh, looking at and assessing um, the bigger picture of what's going on in a family dynamic, and also historical, the historic dynamic, because it's it's very much of the time. I mean, each of the actors in your story are responding to massive shifts that were happening in right. history, um, and then it led to it seems like this kind of self restoration, this healing of the self, which became which you end up becoming a you're almost like a, a doctor caring for your own heart. The work that you're used to doing on these external pieces, you're now very gently kind of guiding yourself through in this process. And I'm very touched by that, by the way that the expression, the, the, the deep work and the slow work, work and honest work and humble work that you're doing with your family story helps you heal as an individual. And sometimes doing that work means telling the truth about family members, some of whom are still alive. And so I, th I wonder, how you navigated that dynamic of, you know, your truth means sharing some hard truths about other people and your experience of them, and yet to not share them would have sh would have short shrifted your own journey. Can you would you mind sharing a little bit sure. about that with us? Because I think other people also sure. struggle with that. Yes. Yeah, so this memoir is about family and it's about people that are alive, um, not all of them, but some of them, and. Part of what I knew that was what was the work here was not just looking at others and what and where their shortcomings might be, but beginning with me, mm -hmm. because and beginning with the things that I had done in my life as a business partner, as a wife, 
you know, seeing nothing is ever one person's fault, but you can't, it's so easy to blame another person when you have to look inside to what you've done. And you know, you always, I remember years earlier, I, I had a couple of business partnerships here in LA that just failed miserably. And one's uh, fantasy was always, one day I'm gonna write a book and I'm gonna stick it to them, you know? <laughs> but of course, no one wants to read that. One wants to read your own ass self-assessment. It's like, it's like I'm, when you're writing something like this, it's like every day is, you know, the yamim no ra'im. You're constantly, mm -hmm looking and evaluating and, and pulling it apart. Now, in terms of family, and especially my mother, my mother knew what I was doing because I was talking to her a lot. And my mother loves to talk. My mother is she's great bravado, and she loves to tell stories. And there's some stories in here that are just insane that she told me. And she knew I was writing them and that I was going to put them in this book. But yet, when I was ready to go, and, and there were certain hard chapters where I had to talk about the things that she did that were so terrible to me when we first came from Cuba. I was a very little girl, and she was just beside herself with fear mm -hmm. about the loss of everything. And um, so I knew I had to give it to her slowly. I, I gave it to her slowly. The first thing I did, I was a little bit dishonest. And in that I gave her my, my mother doesn't know anything about how books are made or published. No one in my family ever went to college besides me. No one reads in my family, so, um, except my brother. But I gave her the chapters. I gave her um, the final draft with the chapters not in order. So that she read, so I, so I was placing redemptive chapters where I needed them to be. And then when she, and I said to her, if there's anything in here that you don't want me to put in there, tell me. And she only had one detail that I took out um, that wasn't even about her, it was about my father. But then when she finally read it, it was, it was hard because mm -hmm. when you read it straight through, the narrative is difficult. And I knew that it was going to be hard, but I thought to myself, and, and this, again, I, I, I struggle with it because what I said to myself is, okay, I've done a lot of hard work with her. I am really on their good and, and there for her. I talk to my mother every day. I call her every single day to just, and she tells me the same thing every single day. My this hurts, that hurts, your brother was awful, he didn't call me, you know, like the same thing. Your son is never around, why doesn't he call me? Um, but I feel like I did that work and my gift to her, to me, was to write this even if it was gonna be mm. a little bit hard. And she's totally come around. Incredible. Totally come around. Right. Well. Um, I have one, I'm going to ask one more question and then turn, turn to Suze. Um, when you started to do the deep dive into your family story, was there something that really took you by surprise? Just as I imagine when you really look at a work of art and you think you know what it is and there are little surprises, it's, you think it's, you know, understand what's happening to the horse's leg. Was there something that you thought, oh, I did not know that, um, that you then had to reckon with? Um... Well, yes, although I knew, I, what, the one thing that took me by surprise um, more than anything was really understanding how almost in, in a, my, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, who was from Transylvania, my father's father, how much his personality was similar to my mother's. And so when they butted heads, how much that was an, in, an inevitable and inevitability. And then of course the thing that always took me by surprise when I started learning about it, and, and the learning was a long journey, was that my father wanted to be an architect when I really understood that he wanted to be an, what happened to him is he wanted to be an architect. And Cuba in the 1950s, I write about this, um, was a, um, there was an incredible moment of modernist architecture in Cuba in the 1950s where like the country's creatives we're in reinventing what it meant to be Cuban. Like in music, we know it all in music as the mambo and the Afro-Cuban jazz and cha-cha-cha. That was their, the musicians' uh, um, uh, effort to become modern was that. And in, and in architecture, it was to create these extraordinary buildings. And my dad wanted to be an architect. And his father said, architect, were you crazy? I built a business. I came as an immigrant. Um, you're going to work for me. And so it was just such a bad choice. So all, all those pieces, but it's like what you said today when you're sometimes looking 
for a page in the Talmud, I think, and you find a different page. That kept happening to me over and over. Like I'd be going down one path and something else. And I think that's sort of the magic of study and creativity where you're looking for something, you're following it, and the, and the, the river takes you in a slightly different direction. And that's where it all, it all comes together. And you have to trust that the other direction that you're being taken in will also be a meaningful one. Exactly. And, um, I love that so much. Um, Suze, do you want to... I'm on a path because I'm in, um, uh, my mother's just passed away. So I usually do these rabbi sharons of Idui with my mom, and it almost sounds like perhaps you used that kind of form of Idui as you went to your family, I love you, I forgive you, and that whole path. Maybe it's just because I'm on this path right now, but I'm hearing that from you, I forgive you, I love you. But the only way you could do that was to figure out how she was broken and how the family was broken before that. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That is true, but it is even, it, I see it as slightly different. Um, it's, it's not only I love you and I forgive you, but I also don't need to forgive you because you, as much as, Everything was balanced because one of, the, for example, one of the things, what, what set me on my journey, what set me on my journey was going away to college. And the idea that a Cuban Jewish girl's parents would let them leave town. I mean, there's no other Cuban Jewish girl of my generation that I know that went farther than Gainesville. That was about as far as you could get away from Miami. But they let me go, and I always said to them, why did you let me go? And they said, we knew you wanted it so badly. Oh, yeah. And the idea that they would be, what I thought is, these are people who were trying to be their better selves. They, they were trying always to be their better selves. And in the same way that my mother just looked at this and, the, and, and just let the painful parts pass through her mm. and recognize it, there, that this is, a, this is a gift, an act of love, an act of here I, I you know now it's also an act of love to my profession this profession that gave me so much um, and that is a profession you know I'm not an artist I'm not a visual artist I'm a, I'm a helper of artists I don't I don't uh, when we repair especially I do a lot of work with contemporary and modern art and especially with contemporary and modern art you do not change the artist's work you help them get, get to where they need to go so that's what I feel like I do with uh, B'nai Mitzvah kids who are preparing their, their Debre Torah. Like, we're not, we're not changing it or shaping it for them. We're just helping it come out, like helping bring it out of them. But especially what you're saying to Suze is so powerful. I saw Sean's, uh, Sean's hand and, okay, there, there are a whole bunch of folks here. It's great. Oh, good. Um, but you, uh, there's one moment where you call them to say, like, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I, think you're, I think it's uh, one of the twists and turns where you're like, I'm going to study art. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, wh why oh, would no, you? Well, that was when I decided that I was, because at one point I decided I was going to study medieval art. Medieval, oh, right, medieval art. And when art, I then, told them what medieval right. art was, what, they were like, are you out of your yes, mind? Yes, yes, right. You know? And, and the fact that that's their reaction, and still, as you said, they let you go because they knew that your heart needed that. And there's something redemptive and beautiful about that, but I think you have to step back a little bit in order to see it like you do, like you do here. So I, I love that. Um, Sean. So thank you so much. Um, you said you, you had this wonderful image of people calling you when they thought something was broken, and you said, but you, did you see that the glaze is about to fall off or the paint is about to fall off? Um, for people who know my mom, um, her maternal grandmother uh, fled uh, Czechoslovakia and Italy to Cuba during um, World War II and lived there until about 1960, ran a boarding house. She was a very successful businesswoman. And she left in 1960, sold the business to her manager and came to, Los came to San Diego, actually. Wow. So my, my question, aside from whether maybe your people knew my people, um, well, is perhaps, sure. right, <laughs> is with the glazing about to fall off and the paint about to fall off, um, what was your family's experience in the late 1950s, heading into the early 1960s? You also said that it was an upending experience, the revolution. My great-grandmother, the story we were always told is that she sort of left just in time, but what was the Jewish community's experience then? So the interesting thing about, um, so Cuba, and I write, you know, I write about this. The thing about Cuba that's interesting is it is a Catholic 
Latin American country, but because historically Cuba was the mercantile center of the Spanish colonial presence in the Americas, the church was never that powerful there. It was a place of commerce. If you go to Cuba, if you ever go to Cuba, you realize that the smallest two-bit town in Mexico has a better church than any place in Havana. Because it wasn't that, you know, that yes, Cuba's Catholic and it's important, but it was, it was the mercantile center for the Spanish colony. And so Jews were, were not reviled. And there was, you know, this is, the, this is the same people that brought us the Inquisition, but it wasn't, Cuba, Cuban Jews lived well. And in fact, one of the interesting things about the, after the Cuban Revolution, well, what happened with the Cuban Revolution, my parents, as my father said, you know, you couldn't help but see that there was a great amount of destitution in the countryside among people. And my father saw it because he was a, he traveled for his father to the countryside. But, so what happened is revolution happens, they expected it. It was the, as my father said, that's how regime change happened in Cuba. It would happen, you know, the Republic was only 40, uh, 48 years old. The Republic of Cuba is founded in 1902 and it lasts until 1959, it's nothing. Or not even to 52 when Batista um, does his coup, coup d'etat. And so my father just figured, you know, there's another one. It's all going to be okay. And what, but what started to happen, the first thing that happened was the firing squads on television. Mm. And then there's a story I tell in my book about, you know, uh, we, had a, uh, we had a cousin. Well, I won't tell you that story. I'll tell you another one, though. But what happened is they, they, they didn't want to leave. My, they, my, grand, my family already had exiled from Eastern Europe to Cuba. They had already gone from one place to another. The idea of upping again and leaving again, and they loved it there. They considered themselves Cuban. I think of it as much as if suddenly we had to leave here. Suddenly we had to go. It would be inconceivable. So, so they tried to make it work, and they waited, and they waited, and this happened and this one was executed, and that one was jailed, and they waited, and they waited, and then a few things happened. The first was that they asked my father, to, who, my grandfather had stores, but they were also in the optical business, and they asked him to go around the country and nationalize the optical industry, and he thought, oh, I don't want to do that to these merchants that I know, but then there was another story and that happened to me, and I, I did a program in Miami with a writer named Adele Rodriguez, who has a well-known memoir out, it's a graphic me novel, called, a graphic memoir called Worm. It's huge right now, because he's a big New York um, Time Magazine cover, where they took us in, you know, I used to go to a little Jewish preschool in Havana when I was four years old, and they brought the children into the room, and they sat us down, and they said, close your eyes and ask um, God for candy. And you close your eyes, ask God for candy, and of course, no candy, and then close your eyes now, and ask Papa Fidel for candy. And of course the candy was there. And when I, and he had the same oh experience God. in his memoir. And because I, I, it seemed inconceivable to me that that really happened. And so when I came home and I said, you know that Papa Fidel is, is more powerful than God. And I told this story, my mother said to my father, we gotta get out of here. That was a pretty much. Thank you. Great stories. And, you know, in, in my, my, some of my family was in Colombia after Europe, and then they relocated to Mexico after the, with the drug war, and they didn't feel wow. the slightest nostalgia for Colombia. And one of the interesting things, you know, I teach a lot of kids or students who are, who are children of immigrants, and people have such wildly different views of the mother country. And there's some people, like my mother's family, who they just could not wait to get out of Eastern Europe. If they never saw it again, that would be too soon. And there are other people who just couldn't let go. Mm -hmm. And I have students from China. They just, they, they love to get out of China. They, they never look back. And so what is your insight as to why there are some people, all the things being equal, why do some people just hold on to that mother culture and others is just like, leave it behind. I want to get out of here as soon as absolutely possible. Well, I can only speak as someone who comes from a Cuban culture, and Cuban culture is fabulous. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's exuberant. It's, it's fundamentally exuberant. You know, it's, it's, it's humor-driven, it's music-driven, 
everything is just a little bit saucy and funny and and people just love their Cubanness in mm. a way that is very much to the heart. Um, and 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 that's and the other thing is that the Jews didn't have didn't suffer in Cuba. They never had a culture of being, I mean, they were othered in a certain way. Cubans have a way of like super politically and correctly calling everybody by like one thing, like all, all Jews were Polacos. All Jews were Polacos, right? And all, uh, Polacs, and, or, Pol or Polish people. And all Sephardic Jews were Turcos, Turks. And all Asians are Chinos. You know, that's like, the, that's like, and it's always been that way, and it's not considered pejorative in any way. It's a sort of, but um, the other thing about this is, is that when I went back to Cuba for the first time, I went back in 1992 to a preservation conference. To me, the thing that was amazing was, I, how, how did I, man well, what, what was amazing to me is my parents didn't tell me what was there. They just told me we lost our country, we lost our homes, we lost our livelihood. But when I landed in Havana for the first time and I saw that it is one of the most extraordinary historic cities in the Western Hemisphere and that it, the whole thing was falling apart, I thought how was it possible that I had mm. chosen a profession that so profoundly had everything to do with the place we left behind. Yeah. Um, so. Hi, Rosa. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction, and I have to tell you something first to get sure. your reaction. So actually, my mother-in-law got us a beautiful, um, it was a beautiful bowl from Italy, and it was meant to be like a spaghetti bowl or whatever, and then it broke, and I put together what I could, but I've kept it, and for me, that's the memory of my mother-in-law, and her generosity. Our daughter gave us a very beautiful plate, and it broke. And I fixed it, and to me it represents our loving relationship because I don't want to give that up. What did she thought of to get that? My question is whether you dealt with that kind of element in your book, and obviously that's a little more direct relation to family. Ye that's a great story, by the way. And the only thing I just want to sidebar say, don't use crazy glue ever. <laughs> just don't use crazy glue. Because if, if you get it wrong, you can never take it apart. Use, use like white Elmer's glue. We can get that apart. If you, you know, because the thing is, you've got to be able to take it apart if you don't do it right. Um, and crazy glue is insoluble, as is Gorilla glue. But, um, but you know, the thing... Um, I've all, you know, I have worked on a combination of things. Like I tend to, for the most part, work on very high-end works of art. You know, um, my clients here are Mocha, the Broad, the Huntington. Um, we do big, you know, we did the gold mosaic on the Academy of Motion Pictures and stuff like that. But, but there's always things that people love that need repair, that, that aren't worth a lot of money and that are very meaningful to repair also. And especially after the Northridge earthquake, there was so much of that kind of thing that came through our studio. Things that people, um, they, can't, they couldn't fix the city, they couldn't control their lives, but this one small heirloom object that their mother gave them who's no longer alive, and those mm. things are just, you know, I, they're wonderful to work on. They're wonderful to work on because they, you know, they really speak to what people care about in the material. I love that so much, especially in light of the of our culture of newness right now, and like something breaks, and so we throw it out and get a brand new one. And there's something so powerful about honoring a piece enough to invest in fixing it, which of course, you know, tra translates so beautifully into relationships, like. You know, just thinking about about holding on to friendships that can break and heal, and really investing in the recovery after something's been torn apart. I love that. Right, and and also, you know, the, I always find that there's those relationships that they break, and you want to heal them, and somebody else isn't going to meet, it won't meet you halfway, and those are the hardest things yeah. always. But, and I always think of um, I forget, you know, correct me if I get the that on Yom Kippur, you have to ask for forgiveness three times from, is, is, how's that, isn't that how it is? You ask for forgiveness three mm -hmm. times, and 
And then if they don't forgive, then it's on them. You're free. Right. Think, yeah. But I always think in those terms about like, have I really asked for the forgiveness with the right level of humility? Mm. You know? Is it or is it provocative? Or am I being provocative, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And just trying to relieve yourself of guilt. So Right. That's great. Okay, well I think we'll take two more if that's okay. Thank you, Rosa. Um, I teach creative memoir writing, oh. and I've done it for 16 years with really? people from all walks of life. Wow. I believe we are always repairing. I'm using the continuous verb, and that the process of art, whether it be writing or painting, my husband was a sculptor, mm. um, I believe we are always transforming. Isamu Noguchi said that you look at a stone and the stone speaks to you. You crack off the skin and there's the stone and the turbulent changes, geological changes, that's us. We all have that turbulence. We also are repairing, transforming, but we never run away from that turbulence. Mm -hmm. It's there. Mm -hmm. And I sort of disagree with them. Um, my friend over there, I worked with immigrants for 30 years, and um, there was always something that they were holding on to. And sometimes it was learning from the bad. Hmm. Often it was the good. But it, it, repressing it didn't help them grow and didn't help them heal. Hi, Rosa. I have a question about the practice of conservation. Sure. Um, so I, I'm hearing you share, and of course I, I love the book too, there are these different sort of philosophical approaches that also express themselves technically. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, when an object, especially not so much a work of fine art, but something like a vase or a practical object is broken and you repair it, is it still what it was? in terms of function, do you think of it as like, this was a bowl that's meant to hold pasta. It broke, and now I fixed it to make it functional, to make it a bowl that will hold pasta now for the future. Or philosophically, once you've done that repair, is the object itself transformed, and does it become fundamentally something different? Well, it doesn't, it's not philosophical, it's technical. Okay. Once it breaks, it's not gonna hold pasta anymore, even if you repair it, because the thing is, you gotta be able to wash it and there is no adhesive that will withstand repeated washing. Um, you know, I say that to people because people, you know, their, their, their china breaks and you repair the piece of porcelain and, and it's like, you can't use it. Huh. You're, not gonna, you're not gonna put that in your dishwasher, you can't, you know, yes, if there's like a chip on the edge and you're gonna be very careful or it's the kind of thing you only use once a year but otherwise it becomes you can have it for your set, but it's no longer. And it is transformed, and, and you know, it's just like human beings. My mother was transformed by, her, by the breaking that happened to her. I was transformed mm. by the breakage. Um, now as a society and a community, we're being transformed by this new mm. horrific damage, right? Mm. Um, and we can only hope that there's a redemptive story at the end mm. of it, right? Um, the art world's very bad right now. You know, the art world in particular is behaving very badly. Thank you. Um, can, can I, were you gonna say something, Scott? Go, go for it, we'll do the one last question from Scott and then we'll close. I'm going to just repeat Scott's question, which was, was there a moment when Rosa's mother realized how incredibly good she is at what she does? Um, ye, hmm. uh, <laughs> yes, yes. My mother knows that I'm good at what I do. She knows, I, I think she knows I'm good at what I do because I op I'll appear in the Miami Herald once in a while. <laughs> okay. Right? Or... Um, or somebody will tell her, you know, I heard somebody said to me that they saw you and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 
but you know, the thing is, like, my brother's an optometrist in Miami, and he's, you know, he's, he's the one. <laughs> I'm a doctor. Can you, can, Rosa, can you t explain to everyone what dwell time oh, is? Yes. So the term dwell time in my field, in art conservation, is a measure of the amount of time it takes for a chemical to work on a surface. So, for example, um, you know, we wash our hands for 20 seconds because that's the amount of time it takes for soap, the dwell time of soap to kill viruses. Um, when, you, when you wash your hands with alcohol, it's much less because that's its dwell time. But of course, it has other meanings. Dwell time is also used as a technical term for how long a, a train is in a station or how long people are in an airport. And, in, and it also, the, the metaphorical component here was how long my family was in Cuba was, a, was relatively short. It was a short dwell time, 38 years. And it marked us mm -hmm. completely. And I think our dwelling on this, on this earth, what we do while we're here and how we manage what impact we live, what, what impact our lives are is really what it's, you know, another meaning of it. Oh, beautiful. Well, I, I thank you so much. This is a thank really you. beautiful, inspiring book. Thank you for I'm, having me. I'm like looking out at a room of artists. And so I know that um, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, please buy the book and read it. And I just also want to say, Rosa, that you, you and Todd have been members of the community and what, very generously hosted events in your homes and in your home. And these are stories that we would never have known had you not shared them. So thank you. And I'm inviting the community to let's keep engaging each other on our core yes. stories. It's so powerful. And there's so much for us to learn from one another. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mazel Tov. And thank you for this community. This thank has you. been amazing for me. Thank you. She...